to have it record. Um, and I'm going to mute everyone before I start the oh, Hi, everyone. Even if I, I, I don't see you. Hello, I see Judy Nelson. I see Becky Lerner. What was that show? It, I, I can't even remember. Maybe it was Romper Room. It was Romper, Romper Room. room. Yeah. And it was like, and I see Karen Lynch. And I see, and, she, and they look through the, the fake yeah. mirror. Is I that know. what it was? Yes, I did something in my newsletter last week about that. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like that? It absolutely. Feels and I see like Jeannie. Hi, Jeannie. And I see Karen Van Hook. And I see Wendy L. <laughs> oh, she has a birthday now. I mean, what? Remember that? That's what this always feels like. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hit Facebook Live, and we're going to get going. So all right. I'm just it has to take a minute, and I'm just making sure everyone people are muted. Hi. I am Jeannie Ralston. I'm the co-founder of Next Tribe, and it's Sunday, so that means we are having our Sunday salon, and every week we invite women to come and talk to us about different themes that could help us in our personal development, but not in our self-improvement necessarily. <laughs> and um, today we have Karen Carbo, who wrote the fabulous book. If you can see me now, you see there's a sloth behind me. That's part of her, the cover of her book, and it's called Yeah, No, Not Happening. And the whole, the, the subtitle is How I Found Happiness Swearing Off Self-Improvement and Saying Fuck It All and You Can Too. On her title, they use the little asterisks and stuff, <laughs> but it, it, next try we say fuck because, you know Right? <laughs> because it feels good. We wrote a whole story about that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, Karen, welcome. And I should point out that Karen is joining us from the south of France where she moved last year was it last summer yeah it was May 2019 wow so we could have a whole other conversation about that we that's might have, right you know if, if uh if necessary uh after November we might have a whole new discussion about becoming expat as long as that's right and I'm available <laughs> for consultation because we have been through the whole thing at this point and I, and I was telling Karen before, and I actually was a, a lived four years in Mexico, and I moved there um, during a difficult political time. And so I'm, I know that's not why you moved there, but anyway. Um, so we're gonna. I don't know, Karen. We didn't. I didn't ask if you wanted to start off and by a reading, or you just. Yeah, to you know what? Um, first of all, this is sort of interesting. I don't. The book published on um, May nineteenth, and I still have not seen a copy of it because. One of the things about France is that the delivery is extremely casual. Oh. Um, but I do, I do have a galley, and I can read a, a portion of the introduction that I think was not changed in, in okay. the final book, just and a little I, bit. Okay, good. And before we do get um, started, I want to tell everyone that we'll have time later for questions, or you can talk to Karen yourself. And I just ask you to put your questions in the chat function, and then when it's time, I'll call on you and unmute you so you can chat directly with her. So uh, I, I really want you guys to be able to ask questions. because There's so many questions to ask. So go ahead. Karen. All right. Here's some, a bit. So this is just a little bit um, about the introduction. It's the introduction where I sort of set up the premise of, you know, why it's important for us to say no to the things um, you know, we feel this compulsion, I think, as women to always be improving ourselves. We feel that's that's even part of our feminine identity is to always be trying to be better. So the introduction, I lay out this premise of why um, not only does it not work, but it ends up making us less happy than self-improvement is touted to. And it's from the middle of the introduction. I am done, reader. Done viewing myself as a permanent fixer-upper. Done feeling I'm always supposed to be doing something to better myself. Then feeling guilty about being too lazy to commit to the latest self-improvement regimen. Or conversely, if I have committed to sa said regimen, feeling as if I'm not doing it enough or with the proper pure and holy mindset. I'm done feeling bad that I don't live in a perpetual state of red carpet readiness even though there's no red carpet to walk and done feeling that it's my fault I can't stop time, thereby remaining an eternal tousled haired beauty clad in an oversized cashmere sweater and no pants 
sipping tea from an artisanal mug by a fire made by a man who pulls down seven figures. Done, done, done. So I decided to swear off self-improvement. A lifetime of striving and struggling to improve myself hadn't yielded much other than frustration and self-loathing. I was fit enough, 15 or so pounds overweight, a domestic disaster, an avid reader, a rescuer of dogs, a good friend. I was no stranger to an apple or a green salad. I got enough sleep and flossed regularly. I don't smoke and that was all going to have to be good enough. That's that. Yay, okay. <laughs> And the, the one thing I should say too is you're known for you're a really funny writer, and it's, there's some really hilarious parts of this, which um, you'll see when you, you read it if if you haven't already. And I also should say that you've written 14 novels, 14 books, right? And, yes. And best-selling series, Kick-Ass Women, which we love that idea. And then the most, the latest one before this was the In Praise of Difficult Women. And um, I just, I love that because I, for me, you use the term, uh, well, before we get to that, I want to hear more about your personal journey, like how you, you, it sort of was like one day you finally said, that's it. And you know, I, I did. And it's kind of a, I mean, I think it was, it was building, you know, we all, it, all of us who have grown up in this culture, you know, we all sort of, um, I mean, I had a subscription to 17 magazine when I was 12 years old. And, you know, I think we grew up with all those glossy magazines. And then the internet was sort of just another layer of, of Instagram influencers. And every, every time we were looking around, you know, there was something that we could be striving for, something we could be spending our money on, you know, there would be things I would read about in magazines that I didn't even know was a, that I would even know was a problem. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my philtrum's too long. Like, I didn't even, that's this part. Like, I didn't even know what it was. And then I realized it was inadequate. You know, it's, it was like, you would read things in magazines and it would just be educating you not to like whatever it was about you. Right. Um, so, you know, it was kind of burbling. Plus I was getting older. And I think, you know, as you get older, you just tend to, uh, you know, you've had enough. You are very well aware of having wasted so much time trying to please people and, um, you know, you're, we're exhausted. And, uh, so, so there was that, but, but what actually happened, um, and like I said, I feel like it's slightly ridiculous, but it does, it does kind of give you a perfect little example of the way that this sort of self-improvement con works for us. So it was in 2017 and it was sort of the year of the bullet journal. You know, do you guys know the bullet journal where it's like, it's not just, I mean, a notebook, like really for a journal, all you need is a notebook, but this was a special one and it had reader ribbons and oh, right. it was also, it was supposed to, it was also designated to make you have, be more productive because your mornings were going to be more productive. So before you even started you during your day, you had to do five things. You had to get up earlier and you had to meditate, exercise, do affirmations, read, and journal. And so that would require you to get, and I, I, I mean, I get up at eight o'clock and I start writing. Like that's just my habit. Um, but I somehow had convinced myself I could be more productive, you know, because I am, once I get my writing done, I am kind of extremely lazy, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I got this journal because someone had recommended it. I did it for like three or four days. And then w one night I stayed up too late reading a book, which is something else I, you know, if I'm reading a great book, it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm still reading it. Um, anyway, so I, I overslept the next day. And I was in a panic because I didn't have enough time to journal, meditate, exercise, read, do my affirmations. And so I was, before I even got out of bed, I was sitting there thinking, okay, should I, okay, affirmations are quick. I can get that out of the way. I'll read just a little bit, but I have to exercise. Or should I meditate? Or, and, and I had created this whole system where I was already, like within a week's time, Yeah, you I had created this thing where I was thinking, you've already failed. And I thought, okay, this is insane. This is insane. And then I sort of started looking at how our whole lives are kind of designated to make us 
feel as if we're failing to be better. Right. Meanwhile, time is passing. Meanwhile, our lives are passing. So that was a very long answer to how, how, how we find ourselves with you with a sloth over your shoulder on the Sunday salon. <laughs> but it, it's a great example. And it really, I mean, I think all of us can identify with that, 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 that panic that we kind of uh, self-imposed, you know, we could bring on to ourselves. And yes, self-imposed. Yes, it's just like, but I also, I love the term you use. We, we often feel like we're, we're too much and not enough. There's like two Correct. together and it's just, yes. That for me, it was when I was growing up, and I still think of this, I think of myself as not worth the trouble. Like I was always, you know, like giving my mom headaches, everybody headaches. And it was like, and so that's my way of thinking, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And right. I just, and I, what I love about the book is it, 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 there's a lot of great inspiration and encouragement, but there's also that great, you did some great history into like the cycles of these these self-improvement crazes and right. we'll talk about that kind of that history of, of that so briefly. Right. Well, you know, and I think, I think it's an important thing to talk about given everything that, that the United States is going through right now. Um, you know, that if there, there was a good time to kind of really re-examine where we spend our time and our energy and our, our focus and our money, this is, would be a good time to do it. Um, you know, historically, well, it's interesting when you look at self-improvement and self-help, a lot of the, the, the memes that you'll see, you know, it'll be, there's Plato telling you to be kind to everybody because you don't know the road they're walking and there's this and that, but these were all men talking to other men. You know, like the history of self-improvement and self-betterment were all educated elite men talking to other educated elite men. Um, you know, we were like chattel, like we were, women were less, you know, if we had even wanted to improve ourselves, we couldn't because we didn't have the mental facilities. So when they started realizing the, what women could sort of do to help culture was after the industrial revolution, when factories and manufacturing concerns started making a bunch of stuff that someone needed to buy to keep the economy buoyed. And women were really good at being aimed towards something to buy that would make their family better, their house cleaner, the food on the table better. And, and you know, you go through the decades and just when women are kind of getting, you know, if, they, if they're, you know, thrown a bone, like, you know, for example, um, you know, only women can be mother parents. And then, you know, okay, I'll do that. And then, you know, in come the experts who are always men selling us new programs, new regimens, new systems. And then we listen to their speeches and we buy their books. And then once again, we're striving to improve ourselves, which also involves buying things. Yes, always. Uh, it also <laughs> involves spending our, our money and our resources. Um, so it winds up pretty quickly getting into a, a, a kind of serious political and right. economic reality. Um, you know, mostly the book is focused on, you know, the way that it makes us unhappy and the way that, um, it, you know, gaining a skill, for example, like you want to become a better piano player, like that might be worth taking a class setting yourself practice time. But those aren't the things that women are usually encouraged to improve. Mm. You know, a skill set that is going to make you possibly too much, certainly will make you competent. You know, it's all the things that we can never get to. It's so for, like for, for our looks, our, our weight, our, you know. Productivity, the, are you the best mom in the PTA? Do you bring the best, you know, snacks to soccer? Did you make sure that you had, you know, that the vegetarian kid didn't get a hamburger? Like it just, it, it just goes on and on. But it's generally in, it's generally speaking in service to others or, or our looks. Mm, yeah. And how, I know you said this, that, you know, part of your journey was you got to a certain age. And I know a lot of us, we talk, next part we talk about it. You get to a certain age, you're like, screw it. I don't care what anyone thinks. But at the same time, I mean, that some of us are able to do that. There's also that parallel track of, you know, not looking your age. So you're... Well, you know, and that's, I think, something that I, I don't think I addressed it 
quite as much as I should have in the book, actually. Um, but yeah, aging and, and you know, the, the constant quest for everybody to look 35 forever. Right. Um, you know, as, for, for one thing, I think it's something that we all have to come to terms with um, for ourselves. You know, and, 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 you know, Jeannie, you pointed this out and I was grateful that you did is that, you know, part of what I'm doing in the book is, is, you know, encouraging everybody to kind of see, you know, what they are going to say, yeah, no, not happening to, and what for them at this point in their life, they feel like it's still important and worth it. And, you know, if, if, I mean, I call it, I think, shoring up the ruins. (laughs) I am still somewhat interested in shoring up the ruins. Um, you know, I, I like beauty. I like pretty clothes. I don't feel that there's anything wrong with that, but, but the kind of, you know, questing where all my time is taken up with, you know, two different exercise classes and, and, you know, der- my microdermabrasion four times a month. And my, like, at what point do you say, this is a waste of my time. It's a waste of my money. And I'm going to accept this. Right. Like, I can accept this. And, you know, maybe what you accept this year, you won't accept next year. Maybe, um, you know, but I think the thing is, too, that is so detrimental about self-improvement in general is that we get in the habit of feeling like other people know, other people who don't know us at all and whose job is to sell us whatever they're selling, they know what's better for us than we know. We should know what's best for us. Also, we have all grown up in this culture. And like I said, I know what's better to eat an apple than a bag of Funyuns. Like, I don't need to join an online whatever to to know that it's better to have a salad than a cheeseburger. Like, you know. Like, like trust yourself to some degree, you know. And, and 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 I do think it's important to point out that you you aren't saying, hey, just let it all go, you know. No become the, your inner crone or whatever, you know, you're not no. saying that, you're saying just make your own decisions about what's important to you and don't, and, and I think you, I loved how you brought it up as a, you did in two, two different ways, you did a true self and a best self that you're always pursuing, right. and you also did the surveyed and the surveyor that, that right. and I, I mean, it, it helped me think about right. the messages, are the messages coming from me or from, from outside? So, I mean, you could explain well, I, maybe to that, those dichotomies. Yeah. Well, I think part of um, why it's complicated and also why we should not beat up on ourselves when we, you know, for, uh, for example, if I still am feeling anxious because I deal with some anxiety, I think I, 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 need, a, I need a walking regime. Like I still grab like for a security blanket thinking there's something self improvery yeah. That, that maybe will help me. So, yeah. you know, we, we, we need to have a lot of mercy for ourselves. But one of the things I think that, that women deal with, that, that women and that men don't deal with, is this notion of um, something that the art critic John Berger talked about in um, The Way of Seeing, which I think came out in 1972, um, and from which the male gaze, that phrase, came from. And it's that women, um, not only, you know, not only are we going about our business, but we're also watching ourselves go about our business. So, you know, that, that makes us self-conscious, right? We walk across the room and we're wondering what everybody sees as we walk across the room. Men generally are not that burdened. And I don't want to say no men are burdened with it, but you know, men strive through the world and that, that's, that's it. They're, they're moving across the room. They don't really care about what other people see. But we are acculturated to do the thing and to watch ourselves do the thing. And yeah. that's why we're such bad, we're so hard on ourselves. So, yeah, and, and, and I get that com- completely. And, and I think that, that it, it was so liberating to read this. And, and I did, um, as soon as I finished, I actually listened to it. And that's one thing I was telling Karen. Part of my like, yeah, no, not happiness to, to finally say fuck it to the idea that I couldn't keep up on reading books like this because I just didn't have enough time and I felt really bad and embarrassed about it. 
but I discovered audiobooks and I've just embraced them completely and I'm not embarrassed anymore. So I listened to Karen's book and it was so sweet. Karen was just on my shoulder talking to me <laughs> like the sloth. And as soon as I finished, I, I sent it to a friend who really struggles with this, like really feeling like, you know, maybe she needs, like, should I go on some medication? Should I do this? Should I do that? And, and maybe she does need medication, but it's just always that quest of like, not being right. enough and 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 why can't we be enough or how you know how do we reach that point so you you do have some recommendations in the book about making i think the important thing is making peace with this it is making peace with you know i and and you know i i talk about this notion of best self that we've kind of all been sold that there is this best self that's out there um, ironically, we never get there. Like the goalposts are always moved. There's never a day when you say, well, here I am. I'm the best. I mean, we go to our grave chasing after this. And then there's who I, ca I call, for lack of a, a better word, you know, true self. And this is, this is the, if, if nobody was judging you, if nobody was watching you, if, um, you know, no one w w was going to shame you, what would that person be? And, you know, sometimes it's, it's very, I've had many conversations with friends. And by the way, these are incredible women who I adore and they are loved in their lives. And, um, you know, they worry that in this culture, they're not even sure, like if they could wave a magic wand and own their true self, they're not even sure they know who that is, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because of this, this best self thing. Um, and, and even if so, you know, in the, in the little part that I read, I said, you know, I said, I, it's going to have, this is going to have to be good enough. Right. Yeah. My habits are fine. Like I have B habits, like, okay, they're not excellent, but they're good. And, you know, the relief of not always sort of, you know, the self-flagellation of having to do better, having to get up earlier, having to be more productive. I didn't get enough done in my day. I wasn't grateful. Like I'm kind of. I mean, I actually do very well in France where it's a very robust culture of complaining. <laughs> um, and, you know, for, for us to say, like, if you said to a French person, oh, you need to be grateful, they would. They would. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, um, just a little bit of being able to know, like, I just don't get up early. That's just not me. Or, you know what? Keep your kale. I'm just going to have yeah, an ice cream lettuce salad. A, okay, you really so hated soothing. that kale. I didn't <laughs> keep your kale. It's a, remember when it was a decorative shrub? Remember it was a winter decorative shrub in a pot outside a bank. That's what kale was. And now it's supposed to be in everything we eat. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, yes, I have had a kale salad that I like and blah, blah, blah. But when I lived in Portland, if you made a smoothie with spinach, it was like you were eating a Twinkie because you were not picking kale because spinach was like the lightweight, dark leafy green for people who were not serious enough about their leafy greens. You know, like that's not happening. No kale. Yeah, no, not happening. But so you, you had some recommendations and I, and uh, for helping us. And, and one of them was to stop thinking so much about ourselves, or, or I guess, is that the right way to put it or? Well, kind of, I mean, it does sound a little bit like our grandmother's advice, but you know, one of the things about being devoted to self-improvement is it requires that you're always thinking about yourself because you're always evaluating, you know, am I doing the program? Did I do my meditating right? You know, my ex, am I doing all the things? Am I filling it out? And it's a very, it's kind of a sad place because it's, it's your surveyed self and yourself and you're in there together judging yourself. So, you know, and I mean, I, I said this in the book and I, I believe it, but like volunteering, volunteering, where you have a task, usually you do it with other people to help other people, winds up making you feel pretty damn good about yourself because for <laughs> 20 minutes, you're not always, you're not looking at yourself and evaluating yourself. Right, right. Um, I, I think it's also, you know, all the things, and it's interesting, um, I noticed when we all were, you know, put into quarantine or lockdown, or in France, they called it confinement, 
confinement, which makes it sound like you're a 19th century heroine who's pregnant in your <laughs> confinement. Um, the first thing people did, they did all these things that brought them joy and comfort kind of as kids, like all the jigsaw puzzles. People were singing in their living room. They were playing Twister in their living room. They were making pillow forts. They were doing watercolors. They were making cookies. They, for the most part, they were not saying, oh, I can widen my thigh gap during this time when I'm like, you know, and all the, or all the, you know, the bullshit that we, yeah. now. After, the, after we all kind of settled in, they started kind of popping out of the woodwork saying, you can use this time, you know, to, to become more productive and to learn Icelandic and, you know, and it started up again. But originally we did not grab those things. So I think of things that I love to do as a kid and they help me understand my true self a little better. Yeah. Well, and I do, th what we, I've talked to people who felt who really felt bad because people were talking about it, reading so many books and, and then that compounded how bad they were feeling about mm -hmm. the quarantine is because they weren't doing all these things. So, right. And you do, and you've talked, I like, I mean, like that. I'm really interested in that cycle you talk about of Like it's a cycle of guilt and shame is that we, we do choose a regimen and then we try it and it doesn't work. And then instead of getting mad at, the, the the regimen we're mad at ourselves right. <laughs> instead of thinking this is nonsense we yeah. think oh i'm not doing it right i'm not doing it enough i'm not doing and you know a lot of this those of you who have you know i guess we've probably all been on diets but it's very much like that diet mentality you know where you're always beating yourself up where you always you, you never think the regimen is stupid you think i'm stupid i should be able to do this better right. and i just think moving off of that even just a little is helpful. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other thing is people have asked me a lot about the title. Yeah, no, not happening. And um, you know, when I'm not actually feeling so kind of sad about the state of the world, I'm, I'm going to make a video that is a sort of instructional video teaching you all the ways that it can be said. <laughs> but the great thing about it, first of all, is it makes you feel empowered when you say it, but also it gives you a little bit of time to say no to something. Um, you know, you're not just saying no, you're saying, oh yeah, no, that is not happening. Like it gives <laughs> you a little bit of time to say no. And once you learn how to do it, you learn how to say no to a lot of things. Yes. Which is a, a, a big part of that. And we can get to that, but we have some questions. I want to, Karen is the first one has a question here. I'm going to unmute you, Karen, Dang it. or can you unmute yourself? Okay. There. Nope. Is it? One more second. Oh, okay. Unmute. There you go. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Oh, hi. I forget my question now. Oh, I know. Do you think this culture will, will, the culture will change at some point? And what do you think it will take to make that happen? Well, you know, as I said, I think what, if we're in a very chaotic moment, and I think, you know, what it's going to take is sort of everybody shifting into that new way of thinking. So if women no longer want to be basically the cash cows for the economy, for the consumer economy, if we're not doing that anymore, which is not to say we're not going to buy lipstick and blah, blah, blah. But if we no longer live just to spend money to improve ourselves, all of us, that will, that will create a change. You know, I think when, when, um, you know, sort of prior to the pandemic and the race war that, you know, we're in now and stuff, I think things felt very solid. Like, you, you know, all the Instagrammers, you would be, you know, jealous of their pendant lights and their, you know, rattan mirrors and their thighs and, you know, all of that. It felt very much like we were all kind of in lockstep. Right. I mean, I would do it too. I'd look on Instagram and go, oh my God, why doesn't my hair look like that? I have big bushy hair. Why does it look like that? Anyway, but now I think that things are so jostled up that if there was ever a time for all of us to just shift over a little bit to saying, yeah, no, that is not happening. This is the kind of time. And, and I do think that, and I, the other people have said this, it's not my original thought that we are learning that what we can do without, like we don't, there's a lot we did, we don't need that we thought we needed. 
So like for me, I love pedicures, exactly. but I haven't gotten one in, in a no, long me too. time. <laughs> and I'm okay. And, and you know, I think the other thing too, um, I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, but you know, if you think of all of, like I said, the, the time and the money and the intelligence and the strength and the stamina and the energy that women have that has been all wrapped up in making sure we look the best we possibly can at all times. And by the way, are hot until our last dying breath. <laughs> if we took all of that and pointed it, I mean, the world has so many things wrong with it, um, pointed it in the direction of that. Right. Because that's how we, we've been all bound up, right? Keep women busy worrying about, you know, their filtrums, worrying about their, their you know, their deltoids. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you, uh, you know, basically 49% of the population is not helping the planet. Right, right. Okay, we have another Karen, because this is a Karen fest, the best <laughs> way, the good Karen. <laughs> Here's Look that. at us Karens, aren't we nice? Why is everybody so against us? <laughs> Karen yeah. Van Hook, you, want, you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask, because you seem to know things about the history of self-improvement, and I, I was just curious if you had noticed something, and if you happen to have any comment on it. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s, like a lot of women named Karen, <laughs> and... <laughs> Karen's. <laughs> yeah, not all, not all. I've been finding some younger ones lately, but anyway, um, there are. But um, so one of the things I became aware of when I was about twelve was I, I, for whatever reason, I had a hunger for a certain kind of self improvement at that age. I noticed that materials addressed to Boy Scouts were all about developing honor integrity, standing up for the weak, having strong character, having a backbone to do what's right. And the materials addressed to girls appeared to be about how to bake cupcakes and smile at people and make sure to clean up nicely afterwards. And so I actually, this is going to sound funny, but when I was about 12, I was reading Boy Scout manuals for inspiration, thinking like, oh, that's how you're supposed supposed to become a, a person who can stand up for what's right. And I just wonder, do you know what I'm talking about? And do you have any comment about that? Because something you said about, no, I forgot, the women, stuff for women is about, uh, tends to be how to improve yourself in relationship to other people. Like for, you know, little girls, it wasn't about how to be hot, but it was about how to be sweet well, and nice pleasing. and helpful. Pleasing. Right. Yes. How to be pleasing. Um, well, let me ask you, Karen, did you, throughout your life, have you held on to the, those values or? Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Like I am so very much. Boy Scout. Yeah. Except that you I wouldn't know. use that word, but I have been. Um, but you uh, have never, okay. But, but you've, you've never felt, you were never shamed for having, you know, having those, those kinds of, because I assume you also behaved that way, right? So you would say. Yeah, I'm always somebody who, you know, speaks up in the defense of the underdog and who puts a, a very high value on being honest and having integrity and things like that. And uh, I mean, I think I get about the same amount of flack anybody gets when they refuse to go well, along that's, with that's, nonsense. Yeah. But I don't know if anybody, this is the first time here I am putting this out on a Facebook Live thing. I don't think I've told very many people the story of how I used to read Boy Scout manuals for inspiration but uh, so I nobody connected that. it as being like oh that's a male behavior you know what I mean I don't think anybody ever I never got any pushback along those lines yeah. but it was just interesting to me that I felt like if you want character development literature you got to go find what, what are they got for boys to read well, and I that was how it appeared. I don't know if things have changed this, now. Did you, did you? Was this like pre-puberty? Because I think pre-puberty, all of us girls were were kind of, you know, allowed to be more tomboyish or pursue things that boys enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, no, it was just around that time. And like I say, I don't mean that I was out doing Boy well, Scout stuff like hunting and fishing. I mean, I would just read about how they would describe what does it mean to be a person of strong character. And then I'd go, well, why, is, why am I not finding this in the stuff for girls? You know, also, maybe you know. those were values of the 60s for sure. Yeah, yeah. As well. Like those, those were values that um, 
for men and women, um, I think were also valued. Even as, of course, you know, women in the 60s, all, all that I have to think about this, had to have hair like Joni Mitchell. You know, I mean, yeah. you, <laughs> there was also, and you had to be baking your sprout bread. But I think what you're talking about um, was, was a value in the culture that was, that, that was something at that time that, that was much more valued. Right. So do you think now they're not even giving that kind of advice to boys either? I mean, I haven't really been keeping up with how things are now. You know, I, I have. If that's I have, outside the scope of your book. I just yeah. to do it, but I I'm have, not trying to put you on the yeah. spot. But you knew things about, you know, the Industrial Revolution and this and that. And I just thought it's interesting. And, and hear what you've just said, that it was the values of the 60s. That, that rings true to me. Yeah. You know, I was little in the 60s. But something about what you're saying right. It, it right. feels okay. true. I'm going to, uh, we've got a bunch of questions. So I wanted to get to Wendy. Wendy, you had two questions, I think. Or you might want to tie them together. Or It's one long run in run okay. on question, I think. Um, <laughs> The idea of accepting myself as the way I am is all great and good, but um, still living in a society where when I'm out in public, I'm pretty much just not noticed at all. Um, now, I've recently moved to a retirement community where I'm like the, the youngest person here, so it's not as big a deal, but I moved from the Bay Area where I was pretty much the oldest person everywhere. And um, it's hard when you get the message that, it's hard to keep saying, yeah, I'm fine just the way I am, when nobody seems to even notice that I'm there the way I am. Well, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I agree. I think it's difficult. I don't think any of this is easy. However, if the option is striving after something that is not going to get you recognized anyway, and is not true to who you are, or saying, yeah, no, not happening, and, and acknowledging that some of those people are missing out, I think, you know, it's, you know, if there's two difficult choices, the choice of choosing yourself over striving to become something that you're hoping is going to garner recognition. Right. So it's that's always better sure. to choose yourself. And granted, you know, the culture is is cruel to anyone who isn't you know very young and very sexy and hot it is and i mean we we all experience that i mean i could say and i could make a joke of it you know if you move to france where i am ladies have a bit longer shelf life here <laughs> um and you know there's been young guys who have been like checking me out and i'm always looking around like is, there's got to be like a girl and a topless girl behind me right <laughs> but um but i don't mean to but but i guess the choice is you can strive after self-improvement never reach the goals and by the way a lot of self-improvement is um ridiculously boring you can do that in the hopes that you get attention. There's no guarantee you're going to get attention. And then if it's really not in alignment with who you are, then now you've also betrayed yourself. Mm. Yeah. So for example, like if you love to run and there's a running club in your community and you like to do it, maybe you join that and you meet people with, with other interests that are similar. And But if you hate running and you think, but I need to, you know, have a thinner ass and maybe there's some guys there and stuff, then you're betraying yourself and there's no guaranteed outcome that you're going to be recognized anyway. Does yeah. that make sense? And oh. I don't all want to diminish how difficult it is, but I think that that's where it pays to really sort of follow your interests. I mean, one of the things that I write about in the book is my mother thought I had, she called them my cockamamie interests. So if I went through a mad like French revolution stage, and she'd like, be, no one's going to invite you to homecoming if you keep talking about the French Revolution. I mean, so, you know, having interests is actually something that I think most girls have were dissuaded from having. Because if you're too passionate and too nerdy and too smart about something, and this was my mother's wisdom, you risk alienating, you know, a potential date to the prom. <laughs> um, and I, I believed her. And by the way, I don't think she was wrong. but you know, at the end of the day, 
I'm much more interested in what I'm interested in. Than going to the prom. And I bet you, you went to the prom anyway, right? No, one year I did, one year I didn't. And you're, no, you know, actually the year that I didn't, some friends of mine and I drank a little too much. <laughs> we went to the high school. We climbed up on the roof of the gym where I promptly fell off and broke my wrist. Oh my. <laughs> so that was the not going to the prom year. I guess. <laughs> I guess your mother was right then. You should have gone to the... I'm she just was. Kidding. I mean, she was. She was in many ways. Bless her heart. But Okay, now Nancy has some questions. Nancy, you're unmuted. Um, well, basically, you know, I was thinking about what you were saying about your mom and, and the messages that she was raised with sounds very close to my mom. Um, my mom, even though she got her BA in, in uh, business administration from Marquette in 1952 and lived in Wisconsin, which is a big deal. Yeah, her, that's a huge deal. Her, she was a model in between high school and college. She was very much about how you look. And it's, right. and it, I mean, she was 85 and, and never had a weight problem ever and was still obsessed with what she ate until the day she died. Right. And I, that really hit me about, I can't live like that. I have beaten myself up for many, I mean, I'm really fluffy right now, <laughs> as many of us are. Uh, but I'm also kind of like giving myself space to do that. And to go back to what um, I think, who was it that was saying that being invisible? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Wendy. Wendy. Yeah, Wendy. Um, I read a really interesting article about um, this whole thing about being invisible. Instead of looking at it at as, a, as a negative, look at it as a positive. And that means that you can do anything you damn well please. Your shoplifting career can start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because so, nobody's even looking at you. Exactly. Exactly. And you can still flirt and you can still be the bell of the ball, so to speak. But I think that um, it's just going to be different than what we're used to. It's, uh, I don't know if you guys watched, um, oh, what was it? The, uh, it, they won all the Grammys. Um, and you know, one of the lines in there was, um, there's something about being younger when you could walk into a room and there it was filled with almost the danger of possibility of meeting some right one. and as i'm getting older and i am i am happily single but open um i'm you know that's that's been a huge change but yet i think if you still put a smile on your face and are an engaging person it's just going to be different so i don't have a question but I oh, you did have a question. You said, uh, what else can we do to toss aside self-improvement mindset? Yeah, this whole thing about, you know, what our mother, I mean, you probably still have it in your head. Little pieces come out every now and then. And All you're the time. Do you know? Well, <laughs> well, but I think that you make a good point um, about smiling and owning yourself is actually... Um, It, it has its own appeal as opposed to, I mean, something that's really interesting. I, I'm not sure, I can't remember if it was in a draft, a draft that never made it into the final book, but you know, it's always interesting. When we watch movies or TV shows, that, oh, sorry, we're having a little party over here. That woman who is chasing youth, fearful of aging, self-obsessed is never the heroine. Mm -hmm. She's never on the heroine's journey. We judge her and we think, oh my gosh, she's like wrapped up in this thing. And sometimes she's like the, the you know, the, the, the sidekick, she's comedic, she's pathetic, but she's never the heroine. Um, you know, any character that chases self-improvement is always a bit ridiculous. And so I just think that, you know, taking advantage of, of, of you know, what your good qualities are, giving it up, thinking about it, having a personality. I mean, I, I do feel like I sound like my grandmother, but, and as you said, smiling, you have a beautiful smile. Like, and actually my younger husband said, really all women need to be are naked and smiling. Like, <laughs> it, it, 
<laughs> you know, and this is a joke that we have had naked and smiling, naked and smiling. So, you know, a lot of it is pressure that we put on ourselves and granted with the help of this massive cultural machine, but it is a lot of the pressure that we put on ourselves. And I think if we can just put a little bit less pressure on ourselves. Yes. Well, um, that, feels, okay. that feels totally weird, but I'm getting into it. Right. Um, one thing that, that I wanted to, um, you talked about this, about Instagram making everything really harder or much worse. And you talk at the end of the book, you talk about your feelings about have come around to social media. Can you talk like what we need to be doing? <laughs> well, I need to be think, doing. <laughs> I just think, you know, if you have a strong, I mean, again, this was all written obviously before everything that's going on right now. So it's got kind of a, I mean, if I was writing it right now, I would perhaps have it be not quite so cavalier, another word my mother would say. You're so cavalier. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, any anybody you're following who makes you feel bad about yourself, like just stop. And you know, I, I have not done that in the past. You know, I've been like, oh, I follow, I follow her more because I want to know her secrets. Well, I don't want to know her secrets. I'm never going to, I'm never going to, you know, whatever I'm reaching for, it's never going, I'm never going to get there and it's never going to make me happy. And I just think, you know, um, the things with all social media is that we really just have to, you know, watch what we're stuffing in our heads. If it's, if it's, you know, there, there, there's some statistic that is it that we check our phones every 20 minutes day in, day out. And that's actually a conservative number. So if you think that every time, 20, three times an hour, you are probably having an experience that is not making you feel good about your life. I right. mean, think of that. And it's not just influencers, it's people who, who post their best, you know, talk about best selves. I mean, people, your, your group, your friend group, whatever, acquaintances are going to be posting the best parts of their lives. And that can create all kinds of bad feelings. Just right, that. right. They're not, they're not I mean, being true selves. So. I mean, and I think the thing is, you know, the 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 time is we we need to be on we need to be on the internet. We need to be zooming like this. We need to to you know this is how we're we're going to be interacting. But I think, you know, in the same way that just because um, there's a an entire candy aisle at the grocery store you know, that doesn't mean that, and that doesn't mean that we shop in that aisle every single time we go to the grocery store. Um, you know, we just need to be mindful about what we're sticking in our heads and what is leading at, like I said, anything that just makes you feel bad, just don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. And I also, you know, talk about like, if you have a daughter, um, you know, oh, I, I mean, my, my daughter is in her 20s and she was not, you know, around when smartphones. It's so funny when you talk about to these young kids, it's like, she's like, mom, I had DVDs and now every, you know, in, yeah. in her short little life technology. Um, but, you know, the longer you can keep your daughters away from social media um, and all the, and some of the studies that I, that I cited in the book you know, that the, that, that girl, young, young girls go on social media and basically all they do is spend all their days waiting for the likes to come. <sighs> they post a selfie and they, you know, boys, boys want to play games and watch porn. That's what boys want to do. Girls post pictures themselves and wait to be liked. Ugh, it's awful. So, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you know, anyone who has younger daughter, like they're going to hate you anyway. So you might as well just take their phone and throw it out the window and just get it over with. <laughs> um, you, there was a, a psychological term you use about when, when you want something that your role model has or something. And, um, and be, one of the problems with audiobooks is I can't put a post-it on it. So anyway. Right. Um, but do you know that? term that I'm talking about? What was it? A mimetic or something? Mimetic desire. Desire. So it's, it's, you know, not only do we look at these people that we admire, we, we not only want to be like them, but if they want something, we want it too. Right. 
And so with the internet, yeah. Can we use, could there be a way to use that to kind of free ourselves up? Like have, um, try to be in our groups, our friend groups, the people, the, I don't know, the ones who are, yes. okay, can you talk about that? Yes, well, I mean, you know, role models sound old fashioned again, but, um, you know, part of why I wrote these four books about these, my, my Kick-Ass Women series, and then in Praise of Difficult Women is because I was always looking for ways of being in the world in a way that, you know, I wanted to have an interesting life. And these women mm -hmm. had an interesting lives. So, you know, to, to say read biographies or, you know, um, become friends with someone who is kick-ass and who you admire, like surround yourself with those people. Right, right. Yes. And again, you don't have to completely turn off the internet, but it's just, you know, the balance of, I, you know, people who you admire, who know their true selves, who, you know, say, yeah, no, not happening and fuck it all a lot. And Instagram influencers, just, you know, if you can just make it a little bit broader in terms of Instagram influencers. And then I don't surround, you know, I surround myself with, with the PTA moms who all they talk about is the size of their jeans. Right. And right. micro blading, which always reminds me of like rollerblading. Is it, isn't it <laughs> girls? I, can, I don't even know. They don't have it really in, in my part of France. Microblading. I, I, I should know what it is, but I don't. Um, maybe I'm proud. Anyway, but we don't need to, we don't need to talk about it because we don't, we don't need to know about what that is. I don't even want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> but um, well, the other thing I was going to say about invisibility, this is kind of off the subject, but since somebody brought it up, I think the really good thing that we can, and I wrote a piece about it because I think that we as women often treat older women as invisible. We are also guilty of that. Of like, like we, like we, we have our eyes on the young ones, like the cool club, and we want to be part of that cool club. But think about the the women that who are your age and older, and and I mean it's very really complicated. But I kind of think I had an incident where I realized that I had done that to some older women. I kind of like ignored them. So I think that's probably one re place it starts is for us to just make sure we pay lots of attention to to older women we see everywhere and and. Well, and I think, you know, the way that we feel like there's a, like a young girl in this body. Yeah. They feel that everybody feels that way. Right. Right. Yes. You know. That's, the, um, and that was one of the things that, uh, you know, next tribe was founded on. And I found like, I'm still 28. I still party and drink too much, you know, and have a laugh. And, and I wanted something that reflects that. And I think that, what you're saying is is true a lot uh, what when i was totally reading the book, all of that you should totally do all of that <laughs> drink too much <laughs> well maybe a little bit sometimes <laughs> well, so there any, let me see if there's any other questions here or comments uh, somebody asked about getting out of their comfort zone but they think that's overrated it took a long time to get into my comfort zone exactly <laughs> So I guess that's another whole whole thing about get into your or get out of your comfort zone. Is that one of those? Is that one of those things that we hear that and we again we're like, oh crap, you know? Now I'm not. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. for some people, it's yeah, no, not happening. Right, right. I am really happy in this little zone here. And I mean, uh, that's the point. Is you know, I think anything you know, the culture presses us to do this, and that's why you know, part of with women, we're always supposed to be improving ourselves. Like to, it is really a radical act. And I mean, I am not talking about we know we need to move, we know we need to eat healthy, we need sleep, we need to drink water. Like there's basic stuff that covers one page that right. we all need, we need to take care of ourselves, but also not striving after these impossible goals is a way of taking care of ourselves right right yeah and, so and if you're if you're like comfortable where you are and you don't feel the need to go hang gliding then it's you know yeah no not happening it's not and, happening and can you just tell us how to look at because after i finished the book every time i saw like a friend brought a magazine over and i looked at it and i, and I was looking at the headlines and the ads differently and so mm -hmm. is there kind of a I get well, I think, you know, the point is all of these, all ads are, you know, they create self-doubt 
and then they promise, you know, what they have to offer you is going to resolve that doubt. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, you know, when we're looking at it, you just have to know their, their, their job is to put you in a place of insecurity. Right. So that's, that's all their job is because then you're going to buy it to hopefully then become secure. But of course you never get there. And it seems like to, to me, because I remember hearing this about women's magazines back in the 80s, you know, and stuff about, you know, creating this whole thing about, you know, arm flab. I didn't know, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. And like creating your fears and then offering the solution. But even if, if I've known that for so long, I could still fall victim to it. All, always. Like, Damn it. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we still fall victim to it. Like that, it, it, it's not like an $187 billion industry for nothing. And part of, as we move through our days, you know, saying yeah, no, not happening and, and making, be, being aware of falling into the self-improvement trap is not a one and done kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, so stay vigilant, women. But I think as you as you do it, it becomes a little easier. Yeah. It becomes easier. And um, you don't torture yourself as much. I guess, and that's the, the uh, probably the main thing is that first, not torturing yourself, but also not spending a lot of your time and money because that is just so valuable. And, and we've got to like put more value, especially on our time, you know, what we what right. we, I mean, really, if your doctor says you're like a fine weight, like, uh, like the number of women I know that have like spent their life trying to lose the last five pounds. And if you could take, you could like fuel, you know. <laughs> I think you said you could have bought your, put a down payment on a house by all the money you've spent on stuff. So anyway. <laughs> yes. No, that was actually some study they did. I think it was skincare. Mm. And by the way, we should take care of our skin. Like it's not... It's again, it's like we all thank you. Someone says I love I know story. people love your book, they love thank your blog. Um, so. It's really just about knowing knowing what you're game for, knowing like I have to put mascara on before I leave the house. Many people do not need to do that. Right. It's you know, is it is it right? Is it good? I don't know, but that's just how it's gonna be. Maybe the day will come when I don't have to. Right. And, but, and so that's what we're doing is it's this when we're really talking about self acceptance is, is this like becoming aware of what's your true self as you've been talking about. Right. Pursuing that without apology, I guess. is that. Exactly. And always being aware that your true self does still live in this culture. Yeah. And God, you know, we'll say. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted, before we leave, I wanted to put um, Karen's website there because she does have a blog called Letters from a French Village, which I've looked at and, and just took my heart, you know, just transported oh. me there. And here, we're so lucky because we get a peek into your little French That's right. See, look house. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. I don't, I think there's, there's, um, no other questions, but we have a lot of people who want to go buy the book. And I, and I, as I said, I've already bought some for friends and, and it's, it's empowering and it's, it's liberating. I think the liberating, like, yes, I can be free now. So. Well, you know, like I said, it's, it's just so ironic. The most wonderful women I know struggle with this. And I just, it breaks my heart, you know, that, that you guys, you know, that, that just if we could have the kind of mercy to mm. ourselves that we have towards our friends that we know struggle with this, that we could just turn it around. Um, yeah. And, um, and also you said somewhere, love your, love yourself like your, your best pet or your favorite pet. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> how we treat our pets. You are your own best pet. Scratch me behind the ear. Yeah, right. right, right, right. <laughs> and somebody was, you mentioned something about your, um, your workshops and somebody asked if they were canceled. I just want to get, cause Karen does, you do writing workshops, right? Yes. I do two workshops a year where um, I invite people to Collier, their writing workshops, but um, you know, that's all different published writers, people who are starting out. Um, it's all inclusive. My June one was canceled, but we have a few spots left in sep It's the very tail end of September. Okay. And, um, we're keeping track, obviously, of everything, um, but France, it looks like, is opening 
for international travel. It's September 20th through the 26th, I believe. Okay. Well, and you have, you guys, anybody's interested can go to her website yeah, so there. Yeah, on my website. Um, Karen, Karen Lynch, <laughs> Karen okay. Lynch, been, she was in the inaugural class and it was a truly, I think, um, spectacular and one of a kind experience. Well, I just unmuted everyone so everybody can give Karen a hand and we can take Thank you so much, Karen, Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jeannie. You're welcome. You, it's Karen. so fun to, to meet you this way in, in, right. in Zoom. But next time it's going to be in person. <laughs> I was going to say, come to France. Yeah, I'm coming as soon as I can. I'd love it. All right. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. Thank you, guys. And be safe. Bye. 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 Bye.